Thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this international workshop on sustainable road freight at the Center for Sustainable Road Freight. My name is Jari Kaupila and I am the head of Secretary General's office at the International Transport Forum at the OECD in Paris. My presentation today will focus on two key areas of work at the ITF. First, on our work on ITF Transport Outlook, which projects the transport demand and related CO2 emissions up to 2050. And secondly, on the project we are just finalizing as part of our decarbonizing transport initiative called Driving Implementation Action for Decarbonizing Transport with a specific focus on road freight. Let me first say a few words about ITF in case you are not familiar with us. We are an intergovernmental organization working for ministers of transport for our 64 member countries. We provide policy advice on best practices for all modes of transport based on our in-house research and analysis, transport modeling and data collection, and of course, through collaboration with several institutions and research bodies around the world. We have been very glad to work also with the Center for Sustainable Road Freight over the years on several common topics and particularly on decarbonizing transport. We also organize an annual ministerial meeting which brings together the transport ministers of our 64 member countries together with private sector, NGOs and researchers. We host the world's largest meeting of transport ministers and are the only body globally working on all modes of transport. Let me start with the ITF Transport Outlook. The ITF Transport Outlook is our flagship publication. The latest edition was published last year in 2021. The Outlook presents long-term projections for transport demand and related CO2 emissions under alternative policy scenarios. These scenarios are based on our in-house models covering all modes of transport, freight and passenger globally, nationally and even at city level. For us at the ITF, the Outlook is a strategic tool. It helps us to analyze how world could change if we choose different policies and development paths. And now, more than ever, there is a need for such assessment. We see dramatic challenges ahead of us, not the least for the transport sector. We are just coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and we are in the middle of the war in Ukraine. Despite these challenges and uncertainties, we must not lose sight of our vision for transport's future, economically, socially and environmentally sustainable transport. So to us at the ITF, the outlook is a discussion starter, but at the same time, it is also a call for action, call for action for the transition to sustainable mobility. And the transformation for the vision needs to start now. So let's start off with demand. What were our projections a little over a year ago? Under our scenario, what we call current level of policy ambition, we expected the demand for passenger travel and movement of goods to more than double from 2015 to 2020. We considered the dip in 2020 due to the pandemic to be temporary and indeed, we already saw strong demand growth in transportation again. Much of this growth in passenger and freight demand is driven by population growth and increasing prosperity. This is compounded to a certain extent because the regions experiencing the highest levels of population growth are also regions of rapid economic growth. In terms of global freight transport demand, the growth is even stronger than for passenger transport. And the key point here is that the freight demand is expected to grow further across all regions, while of course at different rates. And what does it mean for greenhouse gas emissions? 
measured as the equivalent CO2 emissions, transport will see 16% growth by 2050 in comparison to 2015 in CO2 emissions. This would overshoot the level needed to have a change of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by about three times. So, under today's policies, which means all commitments and announcements also for the freight transport means that freight emissions would grow by 22% compared to 2015 by 2050. So it goes without saying, we need to urgently change this trajectory. So what needs to happen if we want to decarbonize transportation sector? We need to raise ambition to reverse the CO2 emission growth. This graph shows clearly that even if we stick to our current efforts, it is not enough to hit the CO2 reduction needed by 2030 and 2050, which should be compatible with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. As countries revise their commitments to the Paris Agreement, there is a chance to do things differently, but the progress has been very limited. But decarbonizing transport is still possible. Under a reshaped policy scenario in our outlook, which includes a paradigm shift and transformational commitments, we have a chance of just about meeting these carbon targets. The scenario, which we called in our last edition Reshape Plus, seeks to front load and further leverage opportunities during the pandemic recovery offering a chance to meet these objectives sooner and with more certainty. And that scenario reduces transport emissions by 70% from the level of 2015. Any projections on future transport trends are subject to uncertainty. The war in Ukraine has caused further damage to the global economy just as it was recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. So how will this affect our projections going forward? The 21 edition of the Outlook assumed a set of potential challenges and opportunities for decarbonizing transport arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the economic recovery from the pandemic was faster than expected and we assumed in the ITF Transport Outlook 21. That addition assumed a global drop in the GDP projections and a trade in 2020. The subsequent years assumed the previous country-specific growth rates after 2020. As the pandemic progressed, however, solutions were found to allow trade flows to continue and GDP had already returned to their pre-pandemic levels in several countries in 2021. Authorities and countries also implemented measures to soften the impact of COVID-19 that have now become standard policies. Higher levels of trade regionalization have been observed since the COVID-19 pandemic. The lockdowns brought about a revival of walking and cycling in cities, including freight delivery with bicycles, facilitated by supporting measures by city authorities. Another trend reinforced by the pandemic has been the already surging e-commerce sales, which sustained in 2021, even though many countries had already started easing restrictions. As with the COVID-19 pandemic, changes in policy responses and the global economy have been seen due to the ongoing war in Ukraine. In addition to the humanitarian crisis, the war in Ukraine has exacerbated weaknesses in international energy supply that had not yet fully recovered from the shocks of the pandemic. The war has also contributed to a worsening global economy, particularly through further disruption to supply chains, commodity markets and energy prices. So given the continued uncertainty in world affairs, the trends in global GDP, changing trade patterns, and the volatility of energy prices, it is very hard to give predictions of global transport demand changes in the short term. 
But despite the current disruptions, transport demand will grow significantly in the longer term because of the expected economic growth and development. Population growth, density and urbanization trends are expected to move upwards and play an essential role in driving transport activity. Factors such as energy prices, land use policies, behavioral shifts, of course, also will have an impact on transport de demand and chosen modes. We will be exploring these issues in the next edition of the ITF Transport Outlook, which will be published in May 2023. In this second part of my presentation, I want to highlight some findings from our work in the Implementation Action Project, which is supported by the European Commission. In this project, we created three common interest groups on hard to abate sectors, and one of them with focus on road freight. Over 30 countries participated in these groups, together with private sector and research institutes. I'd like to thank the participation of the Center for Sustainable Road Freight for being part of the project as well. The objective of the heavy duty road freight group was to discuss technology pathways for decarbonizing road freight. The, the outputs of the project are, are, are several. First, improving collective understanding of the opportunities and challenges in the adoption of zero emission trucks. This also provided a platform for informal discussions, developing policy pathways together. We also developed analytical outputs, comparing different technology options in order to ensure that there's some consensus on key policy priorities and future work. So what are some of the insights from the work we've done as part of this work on implementing action uh, project? In this figure, you see the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions intensity of new vehicles in 2020 by vehicle type and technology. Here we have internal combustion engine vehicle, gasoline diesel, hybrid electric vehicle, fuel cell electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and battery electric vehicle. The internal combustion engine vehicles perform worse across all vehicle types, while electric vehicles offer significant saving potentials. The fuel cell electric vehicles with common production pathway does not realize more benefits than optimizing internal combustion engine powertrains, uh, electrifying them. Plugging hybrid electric vehicles emit more than battery electric vehicles, but may be a solution in a scenario where material supply is constrained, where high electric driving factors are possible, and or where a complete switch to battery electric vehicle is not possible or desirable. While the lower figure on battery electric vehicle greenhouse gas intensity is on average lower than anyone else, it is even more lower in EU and USA and further if moving to renewables. Another key output from this project is a report that compares total cost of ownership for decarbonizing Europe's trucks. My colleague Matteo Graglia will be speaking later in much more detail about the findings. But the key point of this study is that the zero emission vehicles have the potential to outcompete diesel even without policy support already around 2030, 2040 in the European markets. And more importantly, with a, appropriate policy support and incentives, you can really unlock this potential, which will accelerate the timeline of the, the adoption and reduce the uncertainty over the total cost of ownership. How can we then accelerate the adoption of zero emission vehicles? We need different policy instruments at different stages of deployment. Starting with initial technology, research and development funds, pilot tests, market deployment, followed then by financing, low interest rate loans, guarantees, 
procurement schemes to increase the scale and subsidies on the purchase of infrastructure. Deploying the charging infrastructure should be a key priority. The majority of truck charging needs can be satisfied with depot charging, particularly for urban and short haul operations. Promoting the deployment of depot is a no regret action. For long haul, warehouse charging infrastructure is particularly important to avoid range limitations. Potentially also there is a role for dynamic charging with electric road systems. Charging infrastructure is significantly impacted by real estate questions. There is the question of long time scales for deploying high power charging stations and grid strengthening. The results from the work that we just showed are from Europe. So there are specific challenges and opportunities in emerging economies. First, the financing is a key barrier in developing countries. Importing vehicles from abroad into emerging economies is also a challenge. Countries with weaker currencies lose dollar re reserves, and importing from abroad makes it challenging to develop domestic production, which can threaten local vehicle production. Some of the countries that are sensitivity to global fuel prices changes differs, whereas some countries are more exposed. In fact, electrification could help to reduce the exposure to fuel price fluctuations since energy costs are smaller share of operating costs for companies. It is also very important to consider the jobs impacts at an economy-wide scale. If zero emission vehicles cost less to operate, then goods can be cost competitive globally and increase jobs in sectors reliant on goods transport. Emerging economies are expected to build significant additional transport infrastructure. There is an opportunity to future-proof infrastructure, for example through electricity grid improvements during the construction phase, when marginal cost of additional infrastructure perhaps is relatively low. Now we need to also take into account the fact that many uh, operators in emerging economies are small fleet operators, up to more than 90% in China, India and Latin America. And they face barriers to the high cost of zero emission vehicle purchase or grid connections and have limited visibility on bake back periods and knowledge barriers. It is a highly competitive industry with very thin profit margins. So it is also important to better understand the tendering processes between big shippers and small freight companies. The tenders are often for short time periods and truck operators have limited visibility about future contracts and operational requirements. Logistics companies and shippers who contract small trucking firms have a significant potential to set requirements to drive the adoption of zero emission vehicles. I will stop my presentation here. Thank you very much for your attention. Please feel free to contact me through the email for any further questions or comments. And my colleague Matteo Graglia is available to discuss this presentation as well with you. Thank you.